find the opportunities to be like, you know what, enough is enough. I didn't really understand enough about this. I'm going to move on. I'm going to cut my losses. I'm going to get all the points that I need from the rest of the exam. And then I'll come back when I have some more time, right? George, welcome back to the MCAT podcast. How you doing? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Always good to be back. Always good. Last week, we talked about experimental passages, and mm -hmm. we got into a little bit of, of timing of those passages, because mm -hmm. you're like, you, you were giving this a, a example of uh, a test you were taking in one of your classes, and the professor, like, <laughs> at some point in was like, oh, by the way, don't worry about that. And you're like, yeah, I wasted kidding. so much time on that one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, Students do the same thing with the MCAT. And they they get to a passage, they get to a question, and they spend extraordinary amounts of time on mm. one question when ultimately you're not penalized for for marking a question wrong, but you're definitely mm -hmm. penalized for all of the points you're missing for questions and passages that you don't get to. Exactly. So as an instructor, as someone who did well on the MCAT, uh, what is your advice for a student as they're going through the MCAT to mm. help prevent them getting stuck on one question or one passage? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think from a general standing point, there's a number of reasons why timing can fall behind. And I think the most common thing is that students always think, oh, I'm a slow reader. Like, I'm sure I, I thought of this as well. I was like, you know, even in cars, I'm like, I'm a slow reader. I need to get to the questions. Like, why am I moving so slowly? So there's, there's a number of reasons why timing can fall behind. There's a number of reasons why you can get stuck on certain questions or passages. And first and foremost, you have to dig in why, right? If you are a slow reader, which fun fact, this is probably a bigger myth than people realize. A lot of our listeners are probably sitting at home thinking, oh, I'm a slow reader. I just can't get through the passage. How do we read that quickly? Fun fact, the average reading speed is actually around, well, take a guess. I hope our, our, our listeners are thinking, what is the average reading speed in words per minute? It's actually, like, what do you think it is? What, what do you think it is, Dr. K? The average reading speed, I would say, is probably around two to 300 words a minute. Yeah, 250 words per minute. Yeah. So 250 words per minute is a substantial speed to get through a passage. And if you think of like a car's passage, for example, a car's passage on average is 600 words. So if you take the average reading speed of that speed when you read like the BuzzFeed article or like, you know, your favorite magazine, whatever made that Facebook post, it's like you're reading at a speed where you can probably get through a car's passage in two to three minutes. Now, of course, we think, oh, well, if I'm analyzing and I'm looking for information, I need to take more time I need to understand it. And so that's where it's like, okay, well, we're we actually looking for useful information. Are we getting in our own head? So taking a step back to be like, number one, if you are a slow reader, there are things that you can do to work on that, right? There's games out there. There's little things like speed reading things. I always say read sentence by sentence, not word for word. If you're like, in this article today, we will discuss. It's like, if you're going word by word, it's like, you're, you're, you're like, oh, I need to know the vocabulary. I need to make sure I get every detail. You're not getting the gist of it. Every paragraph, remember, in the car section, every paragraph, or even in the sciences, Every paragraph serves a purpose. Every sentence serves a purpose. When you read sentence by sentence, you're like, what was the point of that sentence? Oh, it kind of introduced an idea. What was the point of the next sentence? Hey, I got an example. What was the next uh, sentence? I got a list of people. It's like when you start to classify things as you go, when you start to know what to look for, your timing improves because you're reading strategically, not just word by word, not just give me every detail, not hanging on to every last drop. And so if that's the issue, that is one way that you can already start to improve your timing of like getting rid of the ick of the test taking, getting rid of the mental block of like, I'm not a good reader and I'm, I'm struggling with this. I know there's a lot of things on the Reddits and the forums and all this stuff like science students can't read. It's like, okay, like you know how to read. You've been there. You've gone through high school. You've gone through undergrad, whatever it may be. You, you know how to read. Yeah. <laughs> you've read things. You know how to read. So <laughs> lean into that as in you're not a slow reader. You're not a bad reader. Mm -hmm. It's just, it is a method to the madness of learning what to look for, thinking about argument structure, thinking about scientific structure and experimental passages. What are the important points? What are the important values? What will questions ask you about? Those are the things that you want to start to get better at recognizing that, of course, comes with practice. Yeah. So I, I have a recommendation for people. Uh, mm -hmm. I was one of those students uh, and, and still am a, a reader who... I read every single word and mm. I have taken a lot of time to fix that, right? Because that doesn't help. Uh, we don't have to do that. And so yeah. I started using a tool. It's a, a Chrome extension that is called Swift Read and mm -hmm. it takes 
um, websites. It takes Kindle books. It, it, it takes a bunch of stuff and we'll do one word at a time. And you can set the speed to like 500 or 600 words per mm. minute and mm. the words fly by. So you don't have time to actually read the word in your head. All you can do is visualize the word. And, and you quickly realize, holy crap, my brain is understanding what's going on without my need to go, the quick brown fox jumped over the, right? right? And it's just like, holy moly. And so that has now translated into my ability uh, if I catch myself reading every word, I go, what am I doing? I don't have to. And it forces me um, and, and allows me to give give myself permission to scan the sentence instead of mm. reading word by word. And mm. I still pick up 90% of the meaning of what's going on, mm. even though I may miss a word here or there. And it's it's fantastic. I'm like, oh, I can read faster. <laughs> it's, it is yeah. it is a tool that I that I can do. So Swift the brain, read is the Chrome extension. The brain processes information way faster than we really think it does, you know? And I think part of it too is that when you're over-focused on the details, you lose the big picture. And a lot of the questions will ask you about the big picture, right? And no matter what, like we've talked about this before, even with experimental passages of you seeing things that you haven't seen before, if you get tripped up on it, you're going to end up stressing yourself. You're going to have a mental block and you won't even see the things that you're used to seeing. And so with this idea of approaching every passage the same way, it's like, even when you read, it doesn't always have to be the same speed. If you think of the way I talk, right? I talk through a lot of my filler words really quickly. I make my transitions. I talk about things, but when something is important, I slow down. And you can do the same thing with when you read your passages of, I'm looking at a big paragraph and it's like, okay, let's say it's a science passage. You're scanning the first paragraph. You're like, oh, here's a fun fact about the respiratory system. Here's a fun fact about the cells. Oh, here's an important relationship of gene A activating gene B. You kind of note that down. You can even draw a little diagram, right? It's like you can speed through certain things and you can go a little slower on other things. It's the same thing in cars. It's like, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact. Here's what I care about it. Here's what the author's opinion about it. Here's what Bob said about it. When you start to see those little things of the so what? Those are the things you want to pay attention to. You're like, okay, background, background, background. Oh, here's why it's important. Oh, here's the hypothesis of the experiment. Oh, here's what the, here was group one, group two, group three. When you start to notice these things, it gives you a method to the madness as in a lot of the words in the, the, the paragraphs and the passages are really just meant to be filler, right? Sometimes you'll ask, be asked about the details. Questions can ask you about the details as well, but you really want to pay attention to when you're given key ideas, when you're given key words, and then how to landmark them. Every time, we, we talk about this all the time in the live course of highlighting. Highlighting is your best friend. Now, this doesn't mean like sea of yellow, highlight everything, everything's important. It's like everything seems important when you first read it. A strategy you can try is what we call retroactive highlighting, where when you read through a paragraph, you read through the entire paragraph and then decide, well, what was the key idea there? Everything seems important the first time you read it. When you look at it from a step away, you take a step back and think, how does this all piece together? Well, really only sentence two was my main idea. Everything else was to support it, show some contrast, introduce it. Everything else really goes to support that one central idea. That's my main idea. Maybe I'll landmark some of the other key details in case I'm asked about it, but those are the things that I'm looking for. And so the timing really comes down to, we often struggle with timing because we don't really know what we're doing. We don't really know what the questions are asking about. We don't really know what to look for in the passage. We don't really know like, like we're stressed about it. And so when you read through the passage, get enough of an understanding of where you can landmark certain things, then see what the questions ask you about. When the questions ask you about something that you remember, great, make a prediction, move on. When the questions ask you about something where you vaguely remember where to find it, but you don't remember the answer straight away, go find it. Reread the context, reread the whole thing. I remember as a student, especially in cars, sometimes the most frustrating thing is I read the passage. I look at it word for word. I get lost in the sauce. I get lost in the details. I look at the questions, I still have no clue what to do. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, oh, like this kind of sounds like, let me go reread the entire passage. That's where the time sync comes. So really for the students listening, for the people listening at home, think about where your time sync comes from. Are you spending too much time reading the passage from the beginning? Mm -hmm. Unlikely. Are you spending too much time on questions because you don't know where to look in the passage? Are you rereading the passage over and over and over? Because again, you're not sure what the question is asking about. Are you not making predictions? Are you spending too much time on questions? So there's a number of approaches you can take to, to try and refine your own process and figure out where your time syncs are and what you can do about it. So we talked about uh, at an earlier, uh, earlier episode about... Mm skipping the first passage and just going to the second passage because the first one's meant to trip you up. Yeah. 
there are similar kind of hacks that students will talk about of like, ignore yeah. the passage and go straight to the questions. Yeah. What are your thoughts there? This is, this is, this comes back to no absolutes, right? Because I will say there are passages on the MCAT where this will work amazingly, right? I'll, I'll, I'll admit from my own experience, I wrote the MCAT twice, especially in the chem phys section, there will be questions where it's like the passage is a whole bunch of hocus pocus. And the questions are basically just pseudo discrete. They have nothing to do with the passage. It's like, it was about this big, long, elaborate uh, acid-based titration. One question is about a PKA. One question is about use this random equation you were introduced to. Give me the proportionality between two variables. One question is about like, do you remember this concept in like, obviously it's dressed up in MCAT speak, but the questions are essentially pseudo discrete, where you really don't need much information from the passage, if any at all. So are there cases where let's say if you're in a time crunch, I would always recommend you're at the end of your, uh, your chem phys section. It's eight to nine. Um, let's say you've done eight passages. You have one passage left. You have like seven questions. Go straight to the questions. That's where, at the very least, answer all the basically discrete questions so you get your points, and then see, is there anything quick I can pull from the passage? Points are what you care about. That being said, is this a universal strategy for every passage to approach it? No, because there will be passages where, let's say in cars, cars tests a lot of things where sometimes it does test details, and going to questions first and coming back can help if they test overall ideas overall relationships, you're often looking for a detail when you read the passage and you're not getting the big picture. That's where it can fall into a trap. That's where you can actually mess yourself up by going straight to the questions first. So I always recommend when you read through the passage, get a good idea of what the passage is saying, go to the question, rephrase, what is the question really asking you to do? If you have a good prediction from the get-go, select it, move on. If you don't have a good prediction, where in the passage could I find it? Go back to that section. In cars, it's like, was it in paragraph one, paragraph four? In the sciences, was it in my methods? Was it in my results? Landmark where you can find it and then use that as support. Put your finger on that concrete piece of support to answer the question. And then from there, if you see a question where you're like, I have no idea, flag and move on. Because there's the opposite can be true as well. You go straight to the questions. First of all, I can't remember seven questions going to a passage, right? I have difficulty memorizing the passage. I can't memorize seven questions and answers and then going to my passage. So having consistent approach definitely helps. When you're in a time crunch, I would say it isn't a bad strategy as an emergency last, last ditch effort. Jump ahead to the questions, do all the discrete questions there are mostly in the sciences, not so much in the cars, but do the discrete questions, get the points, and then see if there's anything else that you can connect together. But I I personally would not recommend that as a universal strategy of every passage you see, go to the questions because yeah. you're going to be looking for details when sometimes it asks you about broader things like relationships and, and key ideas and main ideas. What specialty are you interested in, George? Honestly, I'm very interested in family medicine. I think I'd be a okay. great family doctor. Yeah, okay. I, I thought a lot about this and we might be getting sentimental now, but um, I've made the decision of thinking of the different career outlooks I have. I'm good with my hands. I would love to do surgery, but I also don't want to be in school for 10 years. I don't want to be doing a <laughs> fellowship for another 10 years. You know what I mean? Not to scare anyone at home. Surgery is great, but um, I've made the decision that I really want to start a family early. You know, I, I think at the core of it, I would love to be a great dad more than I want to be like a world famous doctor. And so that's a personal decision for me in terms of the goals that I want to do. I want to be there for my kids. I want to be there to support my partner when we have children. And it's like, it's sentimental, sure. But family medicine, it does have its challenge it, uh, challenges. It has its fair shares of ups and downs as well. But one thing that it does grant is a lot of flexibility in terms of hours and the ability to practice and yeah. the broad scope of it while still being able to do the other things that you enjoy on the side as well. I was hoping you were going to say radiology. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> although, although this this kind of analogy works across all of medicine because this is what we mm. learn as medical students. We we learn how to systematically take a history and physical so that mm -hmm. we don't miss something, right? Exactly. And and I I wanted you to say radiology because radiologists are very dead set on when you're reading a chest x-ray, this is the approach that you take, right? There's a very yes. standard way. You look at this thing first, you yeah. look at that thing, and then and yeah. then you, you go through everything in a systematic yeah. way so you don't miss anything. And what that also does is it helps you speed up because you know exactly what you're looking for Your and you're not step. just haphazardly going, oh, I'm just looking all around and oh, did I remember to look up there? And, and exactly. to me, a lot of what you're saying for for the MCAT and approaching these passages and questions is basically exactly the same, is have, have a very systematic approach that yes. works for you and yes. make sure you follow it each time. And I think during that approach, there needs to be an escape clause that says, if, if you're getting stuck somewhere, right, allow yourself to just flag it and move on. Yes. 
Yes. And that's so difficult to do sometimes. And you think in our regular lives, like even as pre-meds, like saying no, the, the equivalent is basically saying no and moving on. It's like, we're people pleasers. We want to do everything. We want to be superhumans, but you're going to burn out in a life standpoint. You're also going to exhaust yourself from an exam standpoint, find the opportunities to be like, you know what? Enough is enough. I didn't really understand enough about this. I'm going to move on. I'm going to cut my losses. I'm going to get all the points that I need from the rest of the exam. And then I'll come back when I have some more time, right? Learning to flag, learning to flag strategically is also a really important skill. You shouldn't be flagging the question where you're like, I have no idea. Like I could stare at this for another five minutes. It's a content nugget. I literally don't remember the concept. Don't flag that question. Guess and move on. You could stare at it for another five years and it wouldn't give you any additional information. It's the questions where it's like, this is a tough calculation question, or this is a question where like, I have a good idea. I've eliminated two, but I can't really find the difference between these two answers. I just need to take a step away and then come back. Those are the questions where it is worth flagging, where you give yourself a little bit of time, you take a step back, you look at it from a different angle, and then something might click. It might not click either. Then cut your losses, move on, but at least you revisit it. You took a step back, you got all the other questions done, you got all the easy points done, and then you came back and gave it your best. That's something you can be proud of, and that's something to never be upset about.